Hi everyone, this is part two of our final exam review. So I'm gonna begin part two by making a few comments on the problem on the screen. I think it's problem three or four. Um, this is because I really need you to understand um, how to break down PV diagrams um, using the first law of thermodynamics um, as well as uh, gas laws. So the figure shows a PV diagram for a 2.6 gram of ideal helium gas that undergoes the process 1, 2, and 3. We've been asked to determine the value of V3. This is V3. Now process 2, 3 is isothermal. So we know that um, process 1 to 2, the volume is constant, so this process is isochoric because the volume does not change. What we could make of this is the fact that V1 is equal to V2. The change in volume is zero, which means that no work is done um, by the system or on the system and if no work is done by the system or on the system the change in the internal energy of the system will be equal to the total energy added to the system now another big part of this is for you to take note of the fact that if v1 is equal to v2 then we know that p1 divided by t1 is equal to p2 divided by T2. This is essentially pressure law. Um, it is essentially pressure law. Now, um, <clears throat> similarly, um, process 2 to 3, is an isothermal process. is an isothermal process. Essentially, this means that there is no change in temperature. Delta T is zero, which means that there is no change in the internal energy because for an ideal gas, this is equal to delta T, this will be zero. And if delta T is equal to zero, then P1, V1 is equal to P3, V3, which is the same as P2, V2. It's important you remember this. And essentially, this is Bohr's law. Um, at, at this particular stage, the, the, this is an expansion because the volume increases. And if it is an expansion, it means that the system does work. In other words, the work done is negative. So the heat lost by the system is equal to the work done by the system since delta u is equal to zero. Um, now the last phase of this is process three to one. Process three to one is an isobaric process. The pressure is constant. If the pressure is constant, it means that P3 is equal to P1. And if P3 is equal to P1, remember here, T2 is the same as T3, which is the same as um, 6, 5, 7 Kelvins. Don't forget about this. We are going to use this pretty soon. Now, from 3 to 1, P1 is the same as P3 because it is an isobaric process. And if P1 is equal to P3, we can see that V1 divided by T1 is equal to V3 divided by T3. That is what you need to take note of here. Now you may wonder where do I get all of this. Recall that the ideal gas equation essentially states that PV is equal to nRT or P1, V1 all divided by T1 is equal to P2, V2 all divided by T2 which is the same as P3 
v3 all divided by t3. So you shouldn't forget um, this particular um, law. It's very useful. Now, so how do we determine v3? We know um, t1. We know um, t3. We know we we don't know v1, and we don't know v3. So we can begin vividly by calculating um, v1. And how can we do that? If we look at what we have, um, we can start first. We know p1. P1 is given. T1 is given. We know T2, but we don't know P2. We can start by calculating P2, and that's easily achievable. So P2 is going to be equal to T2 divided by T1, all multiplied by P1. This will be equal to um, the temperature T2 is 6 five seven six five seven um, we can actually make this convert this to kelvins by adding two seven three point one five all of this in kelvins divided by t1 which is 37 degrees this is three seven plus two seven three point one five all multiplied by two atmospheres. Now if we perform our calculations we will have, now I'm using my phone to do the calculations so um, it, it may not be right. So we have 657 plus 273.15 divided by 37 plus 273.15. And we are multiplying that with two atmospheres. That gives us um, 5 point, or just essentially six atmospheres. Just essentially six atmospheres. Now, if we know um, P2, we can proceed to calculate um, V3. Remember, we know um, this is, we know P, P2, we know P1, we don't know V1, and we don't know um, V1 is equal to V2, and P1 Keep in mind, <clears throat> P1 is equal to P3. Um, we know T1, we know T3, we don't know V1, and we don't know <clears throat> V3, but we know P2. So how can we calculate V3 or V2? That can easily be done given the fact that PV is equal to NRT. This would mean that V is equal to NRT all divided by P. Now, here's the deal. <clears throat> the units of P determine on the units of R that you would use. N is the number of moles, which is just the given mass divided by uh, the molar mass of helium, which is 4. So N is 2.6 divided by 4. That will give us about 0 0.65 moles. 
R, I'm going to use 8.31. And if I use 8.31, keep in mind that the pressure will be in Pascals. The temperature of T, we're calculating um, V1. So this is T1 and this is P1. If we do that, um, <clears throat> T1 is equal to 37 plus 273.15 divided by P1, which will be two atmospheres. One atmosphere is the same as 1.02 times 10 to the power 5 pascals. You can clearly convert that um, pretty easily. Um, this will be equal to, V1 will be equal to 8.3 liters. Given that we know V1, we can use this expression to calculate V3. So V3 will be equal to V1 multiplied by T3 divided by T1, which is going to be equal to 8.3 liters divided by 657 plus 273.15 divided by 30. 7 plus 273.15 and all of these will be equal to 25 liters. Daddy. Daddy. So um, in problem 5, which is in rotational kinematics, um, this is actually a very good problem that will help you to understand the kinematics equations for rotation. So a machinist turns the power on to a grinding wheel at rest at t equal to zero. The wheel accelerates uniformly for 10 seconds and reaches the operational angular velocity of 29 radians per second. The wheel is run at that angular velocity for 27 seconds, and then the power is shut off. The wheel slows down uniformly at 2.7 radians per second squares until it stops. We are required to calculate the average angular velocity in the time interval from t equal to 0 to t equal to 25 seconds. And the total number of revolutions made by the wheel. <clears throat> so how do we approach this problem? Remember, we've been asked to determine the average angular velocity. Now, the average angular velocity is simply given by the total angular displacement divided by the total time taken. The total angular displacement divided by the total time taken. So how are we going to calculate the total angular displacement? We're actually going to split up the problem into three parts. So let's take it one step at a time. It all begins at t equal to zero. The wheel accelerates uniformly for 10 seconds up to t equal to 10 seconds. This is part one. Then the wheel continues at this particular angular velocity. Remember here there's an acceleration alpha, which we don't know. It starts at omega equal to zero to omega equal to 29 radians per second. And then the, what, what happens next is that the wheel is run at this particular angular velocity for 27 seconds. 
it's run at this angular velocity for 27 seconds so from t equal to 10 right up to t equal to 10 plus 27 is going to be 37 seconds and here alpha is equal to 0 and omega is just going to be equal to 29 radians per second and then it slows down to rest at the time we don't know but we know that the angular velocity here is alpha equal to negative um, 2.7 radians per second squared and omega here will be equal to zero Daddy? so um we will calculate theta one which is from t equal to zero to t equal to 10 seconds and theta two which is from t equal to 10 seconds to t equal to remember we only have to do this up to 25 seconds so this will be the next 12 seconds and so this is quite frankly um, going to be easy so if you recall the kinematics equations of motion we know that omega is equal to omega naught plus alpha t we know that theta is equal to omega plus omega naught divided by 2 multiplied by t we also know that omega squared is equal to omega naught squared plus 2 alpha theta as well as theta is equal to theta naught plus um, omega naught t plus 1 half alpha t squared. Now, you need not worry about these equations because I'm going to provide them um, in an equation sheet. So the very first part is what is theta 1 so theta 1 will be equal to omega naught plus omega divided by 2 all multiplied by t1 and that will be equal to 0 plus um, 29 radians per second sorry about that Sometimes this thing acts a little weird. Um, 29 radians per second. All of this divided by 2 multiply by 10 seconds. And if we do all the computation, theta 1 will be equal to um, 10 divided by 2 is 5. 29 divided by 2 times 10 that gives us 145 radians this is theta 1 now theta 2 if you notice that alpha is 0 and if alpha is 0, theta 2 will just be equal to theta 1 plus omega naught t. Theta 1 is 145 radians plus omega is 29 radians per second multiplied by t which is going to be 12 seconds. And if we calculate that, um, we will have four nine three radians. So this is theta two. Now um, the average, the average angular velocity omega is just going to be equal to 145 radians plus 
493 radians all divided by the total time which is 25 seconds and we will end up with Twenty five point five two radians per second. This gives us the average angular speed. Um, to calculate the total number of revolutions, remember that one revolution is equal to two pi radians. which implies that one right will be equal to one revolutions divided by two pi. So to calculate the distance in terms of the number of revolutions, this will be equal to um, one four five plus four nine three radians all of this divided by 2 pi radians and your answer will be in terms of revolutions your answer will be in terms of revolutions now the next question is an interesting question So we have <clears throat> a static equilibrium problem. In the figure shown above, a 10 meter long bar is attached by a frictionless hinge to a wall and held horizontally by a rope that makes an angle theta of 49 degrees with the bar. The bar is uniform and weighs 66.5 newtons. How far from the hinge should a 10 kilogram mass be suspended for the tension T in the rope to be 177 Newton? This is an interesting question and, and please pay attention to the solution. This is the distance X and we want to calculate X. So we start first by doing a free body diagram. Um, so the te there's tension in the string I'm going to call that T. Um, there's the weight of the bar itself. I'm going to call this um, W1. And there is this weight here. I'm going to call this MG. Also keep in mind that the hinge um, a sort of force on the bar and it asserts a force Rx along the x-axis and a force Ry along the y-axis. We call this the force of the hinge. And obviously this angle is theta. Uh, the length of the bar is L. Let's not forget that. So what we are going to do is we will resolve the tension T into two components. The component further away from the angle always carry the the sine, so this is T sine theta, and the component closer to the angle always carry the cosine, so this is T cosine of theta. Now, <clears throat> what we will do is we will calculate the torque as well as the forces um, applied to the system. Remember that the system is in static equilibrium, which means that the sum of forces acting on the system is zero. Implicitly, that means that the sum of forces along the x direction is zero, and the sum of forces along the y direction is zero. This is the first condition of equilibrium. The second condition of equilibrium is that the net torque about any point must also be equal to zero. 
in which case the, the angular acceleration of the system is zero. Now, these two conditions are fulfilled in this system because we know that it is not accelerating because it is at rest. If we sum the forces acting on the system, we see that the forces acting along the x direction, we have Rx minus T cosine theta. All of this should be equal to zero. That means that Rx is equal to T cosine theta. Similarly, the sum of forces along the y direction, you have T sine theta plus Ry minus W1 minus Mg. All of this is equal to zero. This means that Ry is essentially um, equal to W1 plus Mg minus T the sine of theta. This is a component of the force that the hinge exerts on the bar. So the next step is for us to determine the torque. And uh, let's determine the torque about the point O. The reason is because we don't know R Y and we don't know R X. So if we do that, then um, a couple of forces will disappear. So the torque about O will be equal to T sine theta all multiplied by L, which is the length of the rope, minus Remember that the bar is 10 meters, so L is 10, minus W1 divided by L over 2, minus Mg multiplied by X. All of this should be equal to 0. We are looking for X. So that means that MGX is equal to T sine theta multiplied by L <coughs> minus W1 L over 2. We can actually see that this would mean that X is equal to T sine theta multiplied by L minus W 1 L over 2 all of these divided by mg this is the value for x this right here is the value for x now here's the the trick to this problem i'm going to i'm not going to um, give you the value of x, but I want you to actually put in the values of t sine theta l w1 and calculate the value of x in the answer in your answer sheet that you will submit tomorrow. Um, so this is actually to distinguish people who will do this and people who will not. Um, keep in mind that t is equal to 177 newtons. Um, w1 is equal to 66.5 newtons. Um, Mg, M is equal to 10 kilograms. G, you should take G as 10 meters per square seconds. And L is equal to 10 meters. So you have everything here. Put in the value in this expression and determine the value of X. Now, one thing that you must pay attention is to calculate Rx and to calculate Wy. And that is pretty straightforward because you know this, you know this, you know this, you know this. So in the exam, instead of me asking you to calculate X, I can rather ask you to calculate 
the forces exerted by the hinge on the bar. So keep that in mind. The next question is a center of mass as well as the moment of inertia problem. The center of mass as well as the moment of inertia problem. Whenever you're given a problem like this that involves masses on a table, it is always essential for you to sketch the masses. I'm going to call this um, M1, M2, M3. And so if we draw our axis, our little axis, <clears throat> this is the maximum value for x is 7. So this is 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. This is 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, somewhere there. This is y, and this is x. For M1, the X is 0, Y is 7. So M1 is pretty much here. That is M1. M2 um, is 5, 2. 5, 2. So M2 is around here. This is M2. And M3 is 7, 10, 7, 10. So M3 is around there, M3. And so if you take note of the coordinates, this is 0, 7. Right here, this is 5, 2. And right here, this is 7, 10. So the coordinates of the center of mass, you have x, c, m. This is given by the summation of m, i, x, i, divided by the summation of m, i. In this case, there are three masses. So this is m1, x1, plus m2, x2, plus m3, x3, all of this divided by M1 plus M2 plus M3. Um, similarly, the Y coordinates of the center of mass is the summation of MI, YI divided by the summation of MI. This is equal to M1, Y1 plus M2, Y2 plus M3, Y3. All of these divided by M1 plus M2 plus M3. So if we want to put in the values, we will have um, XCM equal to M1 is 40 kilograms. Don't forget the units. X1 is 0 meters plus M2 is 60 kilograms and X2 is 5 meters plus M3 is 100 kilograms and X3 is 7 meters. All of these divided by 40 plus 60 plus 100 kilograms. And so... Calculate this expression and put in the value. Calculate that expression and put in the value um, in the response sheet that you will submit in class. Similarly, YCM will be equal to 40 kilograms multiplied by 7 meters plus 60 kilograms multiply by 2 meters plus 100 kilograms multiply by 10 meters all divided by 40 
plus 60 plus 100 kilograms. Now, as, as usual, calculate this value with your calculator and give me the value in class. Now, this gives you the coordinates of the center of mass. Now, the next phase is for us to calculate the moment of inertia um, about an axis perpendicular to the xy plane. The moment of inertia about an axis perpendicular to the xy plane. That means that the axis is along the z plane. It's actually coming outside of the your paper. <clears throat> so generally, the moment of inertia i is given by the summation of m i r i squared. m i r i squared. So the axis perpendicular, we need to calculate the moment of inertia of the rigid body through the center of mass and perpendicular to the xy plane and perpendicular to the x y plane um, <clears throat> so i will be equal to m1 r1 squared plus m2 r2 squared plus m3 r3 squared so the question that you have to answer is what is r1 what is r2 and uh, what is r3 in this case you will have to use the pythagorean theorem r1 is equal to the square root of <clears throat> let me put it this way it will be easier if i label this point um let me label this point a let me label this point B and let me label this point C. Um, we want to determine the distances to the center of mass. Now, the center of mass actually, let me give you the values. Um, X, XCM is equal to 5 meters y cm is equal to seven meters since we need this to calculate um, our moment of inertia this is really a good problem and you should pay attention to all of this please um, <clears throat> so this would mean that r1 is simply equal to ax which is the square root of 7 minus 7 squared plus 5 minus 0 all squared. This will be equal to 5 meters. Similarly, R2 is equal to Bx, which is the square root of um, 10 minus 7 all squared plus 7 minus 5 all squared. And all of this will be four meters and similarly r3 will be equal to cx and that is um, 2 minus 7 all squared plus um, 5 minus 5 all Daddy. squared that will give us 5 Daddy. meters yes Daddy. really uh-huh yeah Daddy. So this means that um, <clears throat> the moment of inertia I will be equal to 40 kilograms multiplied by 5 meters squared plus 60 kilograms multiplied by 4 meters all squared plus 100 kilograms multiplied by 5 meters squared.
So compute this value and make sure that your packet that you submit tomorrow has it. <clears throat> the next question, um, which is question number eight, is on fluid dynamics. This is a very good question. Um, you've seen this question before. And so I feel that this concept here, um, really, it's, it's important for you to keep track of. It says that a large cylindrical water tank, 11.5 meters in diameter and 13.5 meters tall, is supported um, 8.75 meters above the ground by a stand as shown in the figure below. The water level in the tank is 10.6 meters deep. The density of water is 1 gram per cm cube. A very small hole is formed at the base of the vertical wall of the tank and the water is squeezing out of this hole. When this water hits the ground, how far has it traveled horizontally from the ground? So we have a situation where the water leaves and we want to calculate the horizontal distance it travels. I'm going to call this distance R before it finally hits the ground. All right, so the very first thing we need to do is determine the speed of the water at the base of the can. And we know from Bernoulli's equation that V naught, V naught is equal to the square root of 2GH, where H is this distance. It's this distance. Remember, H is actually this distance, that is h. So this will be equal to the square root of 2 multiplied by 10 meters per square seconds multiplied by 10.6 meters. That gives you v naught. So calculate the value of v naught. And how will I grade this? This is actually a 10 point problem. This is 1.2 and this is three. So we still have um, six points to go. The next step is to calculate this particular distance. We know that the water follows a projectile path. So um, the distance traveled R is equal to V naught multiplied by the total time it takes for the water to hit the ground. Multiply by the total time it takes the water to heat the ground. And what is that total time? To determine this total time, remember that this distance from here to here, let's call this distance y, or y max. y max is equal to 1 half gt squared. That means that t is equal to the square root of 2y max divided by g. And what you need to do is calculate t. Noting that y max is equal to 8.75 meters and g is equal to 10 meters per second squared. Fit in these values and then calculate T. Then your horizontal distance R is just going to be V naught multiplied by T. Or it's going to be the square root of G, sorry, of 2 G H multiplied by the square root of 2 Y max divided by G. If, 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 if you are fancy enough, you can combine this, those two, which means that R will be equal to the square root of 2GH, 2Y max, divided by G. The Gs can cancel, which would mean that R is just going to be equal to 4 y max 
multiply by h. You know that y max is equal to 8.75 meters, h is equal to 10.6 meters. So you put in this value in here and you will be able to determine the horizontal distance traveled. The next question, which is number nine. Now, this is also a PV graph. <clears throat> BC is isobaric. Isobaric, which means that the pressure remains the same. So delta U1 will be equal to Q1 plus WBC. And QBC is just CP multiplied by the change in volume. The change in volume from A to D. Keep that in mind. Similarly, um, C D is an isochoric process. Isochoric in the sense that, that there is no change in volume, which means that VC is equal to VD. And if there is no change in volume, it means that the work done is equal to zero. And if the work done is equal to zero, delta U C D is equal to Q C D, which is just C V multiplied by the change in temperature. Now, because the volume is constant, it's also important for you to keep in mind that um, P1 or PC over TC is equal to PD over TD. Um, similarly, DA is an isobaric process as well as AB is an isochoric process. It all repeats itself. Now, we have been asked to determine, um, it says that in the figure, a certain process, in the figure above, in a certain process, 1,190 joules of heat flows into the system. At the same time, the system expands against a constant external pressure of 7 times 10 raised to the power of 4 pascals. If the volume of the system increases, there is an expansion, which means that the system does work which means that the work done is negative, calculate the change in the internal energy of the system. Now, is this change zero, positive, or negative? Obviously, let me give you a trick. There is an expansion, which means that the system does work. And if the system does work, the system loses energy. If the system loses energy, it means that the total internal energy of the system decreases. So we're expecting a negative value. So that's just something for you to check um, yourself on. Now, understand that a certain amount of heat is added to the system. So Q is positive, which is 1,190 joules. Now, the system does work at this constant pressure. So remember work done is equal to P delta V. We did this in class. And which is equal to seven, which is equal to 7.00 .00 times 10 to the four pascals. The change in volume is 0 0.08 minus 0 0.02. And if you compute all of that, 
0 0.08 minus 0 0.02 that gives you um, 4.2 times 10 to the 3 joules that is the amount of work done by the system so the change in the internal energy u is just going to be equal to q minus w remember it's negative why is it negative because the system does work the system does work when the system does work it is expanding and the work done will be negative that's why this explain this negative sign so this will be equal to um, one one nine zero joules minus 4.2 times 10 to the 3 joules and that gives us that means that that delta u is equal to negative negative 3 or 10 joules as we expected there is a decrease in the internal energy of the system this is really a beautiful problem so please um, review this as much as you can um, and the last problem in this series is a ladder problem we did a couple of examples in class so I just want to reinforce this concept to you pay attention because uh, the last problem of the exam will be a ladder problem so um, just so that you should know um, so the very first step we do when we are given a problem like this is to draw a free body diagram. So right here, we have the normal force on the floor N1. We have a normal force, force due to the wall N2. We have the weight of the firefighter. I'm going to call this WF. We have the weight of the ladder. I'm going to call this WL. Now, also keep in mind that the ladder has a tendency to slide this way. And therefore, there is a friction force acting on the floor, preventing it from sliding. And that friction force, I'm going to call this Fs. Similarly, the question says that a ladder, a ladder of weight 200 newtons and length 10 meters lean against a smooth wall, so there is no friction on the wall. A firefighter of weight 600 newton climbs a distance x up the ladder. The coefficient of friction between the ladder and the wall is 0. Point, and the floor is 0. 0.5. What is the maximum value of X if the ladder is not to sleep? So we are actually working through the system in equilibrium. I'm going to level this um, point A and this point B. And because the system is in equilibrium, we know that the sum of forces acting on the system is zero, which means that the sum of forces along the X direction is zero and the sum of forces along the y direction is also a zero. Looking at the x direction, the sum of forces Wx will mean that f of s minus n2 will be equal to zero, in which case f of s is equal to n2. Now, if we consider the forces along the y direction, the summation of Fy would imply that N1 minus WL minus WF will be equal to zero, in which case N1 is equal to WL plus WF. Now, just as a side note, the static friction on the floor is defined as is less than or equal to mu s n1.
for when f of s is maximum, this will be equal to mu s n1. So it's important for you to keep this in mind. And remember, n1 is equal to the weight of the leader plus the weight of the firefighter. Now, with this, with all this in mind, the next and the final step is for us to take the talk about the point um, A or B. So the question is, which point is most appropriate? So, um, <clears throat> we therefore have N1 equal to the weight of the leader, which is, this will be 200 newtons plus 600 newtons. This is going to be 800 newtons. This implies that F of S max is equal to 0 0.5, which is given, multiplied by 800 newtons. This is 400 newtons. So pay attention, please. Um, and therefore, if we know f of s, we can say that n2 is therefore equal to 400 newtons. Just to recap the main point, N1 is the normal force due to the floor and N2 is the normal force due to the wall. So in, the, in an examination, you can be asked to determine N1, you can be asked to determine N2, you can be asked to determine the maximum friction that the ladder will experience at a particular length, um, which we have calculated. Now, the next task is for us to actually find the value of x. And to find the value of x, because the system is in equilibrium, we know that the summation of torque about any point must be equal to zero. So this implies that negative WL um, L remember WL the length of the ladder from the pivot keep in mind <coughs> that we have to calculate these distances we need to know this distance which is just going to be the height of the wall, H. We need to know this distance. I'm going to call this L1 and this distance L2. And it will be easier that way. So we have here WL multiplied by L1 minus WF multiplied by L2 plus N2 multiplied by H. All of that will be equal to zero. So this would mean that W, this is negative WL, which is the weight of the ladder is 20 Newtons. L1 is just 10 the sine of 50 degrees minus 60 newtons l2 l2 in this case is going to be x which is what we are looking for um, the sine of 50 degrees plus N2, which is 400 Newtons, multiplied by H, which is just going to be 10, 
cosine of 50 degrees. All of these will be equal to zero. Now, I'm going to end here because the only unknown in this equation is x. So you have to look for x and write down your value in the practice exam worksheet and submit it in class for extra credit as well as for your homework that is due. Um, I've done all the problems for you and I've actually explained the problems step by step. If you have any questions, so please send me an email. Um, most likely I have spent uh, over six to eight hours developing this video um, from shooting um, to editing as well as to rendering. So um, I will send you this video, I'll send this video out. Um, there will be officially be a class today, but the class will be not be in school. It will be wherever you are watching this video. So if you have um, any questions, I welcome that you should send me an email and I will do my best to respond to you um, before midday tomorrow. Um, good luck on your preparation. Please focus on this set of problems and try to understand the physics behind these problems. Thank you so much. I look forward to seeing all of you tomorrow. Bye.